So like I said, we are essentially augmenting the state with a new variable. This new variable is the parameter update law. Okay, that's what we say. So your complete dynamics will look like uh, e1 dot is e2, e2 dot is theta tilde fxt minus k2 psi2. Let's see. What else? No, no, no. I did not. Did I get this wrong? Uh, psi two dot will be theta tilde f x t. Uh, minus k two psi. Correct. So this is actually not. E1 dot is E2, this is equal to psi2 plus psi2 minus, okay, I don't know why that's happening, okay, and I will have theta hat dot is equal to, or in fact, I will write it the other way around, theta tilde dot is equal to minus theta hat dot, and that's equal to minus gamma psi 2 fx all right and for this what was the v so this is the entire closed loop system okay this is the entire closed loop system this guy is of course the parameter update theta hat 0 arbitrary for the states, obviously, everything is given to you, right? I mean, you are given the initial conditions and everything. But for the parameter update, the initial condition is arbitrary, yeah? You don't, you don't, you should start close to the true value, but you don't have to. Huh? There is no such requirement, all right? Now, let's see what happens to a tra tracking objective. Hmm? So, uh, what was the V? The V was half E1 square plus half Psi2 square plus 1, 2 gamma theta tilde squared and V dot was minus K1 minus half E1 squared minus K2 minus half psi2 squared. Yeah, the first one is positive definite, the second one is only negative semi definite. Okay, so obviously you have uniform stability in the sense of Lyapunov. That's one. Now we want to do signal chasing, okay? Because we have negative semi-definite semi v dot. We are exactly in the domain of Babelitz lemma, right? So we want to do signal chasing, right? So how does that look? Exactly the same steps, right? What is the first step? Yeah, I'm not gonna go back. Huh? Yeah, the first step, set of steps is to prove that everything that shows up in V dot is going to go to 0. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, and you can even do it in a smarter way, by the way. You can, in fact, just, I mean, some people also do this. They just try to prove that V dot is going to go to 0. Because if V dot goes to 0, then each of these terms go to 0. Okay, that is another way of doing it. Yeah. But I would say you stick to the steps I said, yeah, don't try to come up with your own steps. The first step in trying to prove everything in V dot goes to 0 was that you say that V is lower bounded and non-increasing, right? So I know that V is lower bounded and non-increasing, yeah? What does this imply? It implies that V infinity which is basically limit as e goes to infinity v of t exists and finite this was the first step remember yeah, i have done i have done this too many years so i know 
I remember the steps. Yeah. What was the second step? You don't remember it. Okay, fine. We 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 look at boundedness of all signals in V. Okay. So it's very obvious that V of T is less than equal to V of zero because V is non increasing by this. So, if v is non increasing, then vt is less than or equal to v0, which means that none of these can become unbounded if they started bounded, right? And they did start bounded, right? I mean, otherwise, I would doubt the sanity of the simulations, okay? Which implies E1, psi2, theta tilde, all are bounded signals. Now, because I am going towards Barbell Alzheimer, right? I want to prove that. If I want to prove that everything inside V2 is going to 0, I want to prove that these signals have are LP, L infinity and the derivatives are LP or L infinity and so on. Okay. So, now I want to prove that these signals are L2, but that is pretty straightforward. I am going to integrate this guy, integrate both sides V dot E dt 0 to infinity is equal to integral 0 to infinity minus k1 minus half e1 square minus k2 minus half psi2 square. Yeah, just integrating both sides, right. Now, I know what is my left hand side. My left hand side is actually, what is my left hand side? Right, v infinity minus v0. So, I am going to say v0 minus v infinity because I am going to flip the signs on the right hand side. This is just k1 minus half integral 0 to infinity e1 square t dt plus k2 minus half integral 0 to infinity psi2 square t dt, right. Yes. Now, it should be obvious to you from just this equality that individually each of these is finite. Yes. Why? Why is individually each of these finite from this equality? I am saying this is finite, this is finite. Why? This is finite, sure. Now, what? I am saying that this integral is finite and this integral is finite just from this. How do you conclude that? First thing, is there anything negative on the right hand side? Any Can anything be negative quantity here on the right hand side? No, right? No, right? Because I am taking integral of a square term. So, everything, the integrand itself is not negative. Therefore, if I take integral, obviously not negative. Integral is just a limit of a sum, right. Obviously, not negative, not negative, plus sign, not negative, not negative. They cannot cancel each other, okay. This cannot cancel anything here, okay. Which means what? If the sum is actually equal to this, individually each of them, right has to be right otherwise yeah if this is bigger than v0 minus v infinity there is a problem this will become a greater than yeah but that's not the case so individually each of them because they don't cancel each other out right so obviously this individually each of them is less than or equal to v0 minus v infinity and if you notice this is enough right to claim that e1 is in L2 and this gives me psi2 is in L2, right, okay, all right. Now, I can use the bubble at lemma, right. Oh, no, I am not done yet, sorry. What about E1 dot and psi2 dot? I am claiming they are bounded, okay. I am claiming they are bound. What is E1 dot? E1 dot is E2. What is psi2 dot? psi2 dot is this. I already know that psi2 is bounded, okay. I already know theta tilde is bounded, 
yeah just proved theta tilde is also bounded because it appears here right so the only requirement is that f remain bounded okay so this requires me to make an assumption okay notice just by the fact that e1 psi2 are bounded x will also be bounded okay it may not be obvious to you yeah but e1 and psi2 are basically just errors coming from the errors errors with the reference trajectory the reference trajectory is typically a bounded trajectory yeah you don't never give a unbounded trajectory so you have a reference trajectory so you are computing error between your states and your reference states which are bounded okay and if you say that your error itself is bounded then it means you are only a bounded distance away from the reference trajectory right and if the reference itself is bounded you are a bounded distance away from the reference then x itself the states itself also have to be bounded okay so if you say that essentially error bounded means x minus uh, here when i say states are bounded this is basically also means x1 minus r is l infinity right right and r is already l infinity right therefore x1 is l infinity okay so basically you also have that x is itself bounded okay so in order for psi2 to be bound psi2 dot to be bounded what do you need you need that this quantity be bounded okay not always but when the input states are bounded okay so the assumption is typically written as uh, assume f x comma t is bounded for bounded x and all t okay if you make this assumption you will immediately have that e1 dot and e2 dot which is minus k2 psi2 plus theta tilde fxt are bounded okay and once you have this you can use the corollary to barbalat's lemma to claim that what i can claim that e1 and psi2 are going to zero okay i actually need no further steps although the when i showed you the application of the barbalat's lemma i used further steps but right now i do not need further steps right because e1 and psi2 going to zero implies what e1 and e2 are going to zero okay so i have achieved tracking yeah rather amazing although it looks like i did very simple things some simple manipulations here and there again please go back and read so you can follow huh? but just by introducing so what did i do in essence in essence my controller which was a what we call a static controller became a dynamic controller what is a dynamic controller the control depends on some value which comes from a dynamical system right so my control depends on theta hat and theta hat comes from this dynamics so just by moving from a static controller to a dynamical control it's almost like saying i added some integrator in my controller okay not a linear integrator but a non linear integrator okay by adding a non linear integrator in my controller i made my system agnostic to unknown parameters yeah i don't know the parameter i actually don't know the dynamics well at all but i exactly track the trajectory this is not an approximation okay i exactly track the desired trajectory in the absence of disturbance and all that of course of course see you all of you must have at some point or the other seen or heard of robust control okay what is robust control it's all this L h infinity and this kind of control yeah what is the idea in robust control the idea is that and that's applicable only for linear systems typically there the idea is you uh, design the for linear systems at least 
you design the control in such a way, the control gains in such a way that it can tolerate some error in parameters, okay. But the error is rather limited, you do not know how much error, okay. The error it can tolerate is not infinite, not significant, okay. It can tolerate some error in the parameters, okay. Beyond that you will get only bounded performance. In fact, even with the error, you will only get bounded performance. You are only guaranteed that your system will not blow up. You are going to get a nice bound around the desired trajectory, okay. But here what are you doing? Here and I mean I am not saying that is a bad method or anything. I am just saying that that is a different method. In that method, the advantage is you are not changing the control structure at all. The control structure remains the same in robust controls, okay. There is some whatever, some PD, KX, minus KX type of a feedback. It is like a state feedback, okay. Structure remains the same. Here it is no longer just pure state feedback. Here you have a dynamic feedback, right. You have a theta hat dot. So, there is a dynamic feedback that is happening, okay. So, we have changed the structure of the control, but what have we achieved? We have achieved precise tracking, okay. So, in adaptive control, you can achieve precise tracking even if you do not know the system, okay. And that is pretty amazing if you think about it, okay. Now, if I do the rest of the steps, I, I told you that this steps is enough, I have already achieved tracking, okay. Let us see what the rest of the steps give me, okay. If I do the rest of the steps, I would essentially be able to prove that even dot and psi 2 dot go to 0, right. That is what we have been doing. We started with proving that everything that is in V dot goes to 0, then we prove that the derivatives of those quantities go to 0 and we can, yeah, we can, can prove that this happens, okay. But even dot going to 0 just means E2 goes to 0 that we have already proved, so nothing special there. But psi 2 dot going to 0 gives me what? It gives me that minus k2 psi 2 plus theta tilde fxt goes to 0. But again, I already know that psi 2 already goes to 0. So, what do I have? I have that theta tilde fxt goes to 0, okay. Unfortunately, I have not proven anything about parameter convergence, okay. No evidence of parameter convergence or <laughs> if you folks like this learning. I did not learn squat, okay. I did not learn the parameter, okay. Now, that is, uh, I mean it may not seem nice to you, but that is sort of the power of this method, yeah. It did not require you to learn the parameter. I still did pretty nice tracking control. If you give me a robot or if you give me an airplane or if you give me a quad rotor, I am doing my tracking, I do not care to learn some parameters, I do not care to learn the inertia, that is not my job as an engineer, right. I wanted to go to the waypoints, go to the, you know, particular uh, formation, do whatever I wanted to do, I wanted to do the control task, I do not care if it learns the parameters, okay. But then if you do care about the learning part, yeah, uh, then you have, then there are some results, yeah, which are connected to what is called persistence of excitation. And these results are required also in deep learning, by the way. It may not, these do not come up obviously up front, yeah. You will not uh, do good learning unless your data set is rich enough, yeah. And how you specify rich enough, which is a very, very vague word, is using persistence of excitation. This idea comes from system identification. This has got nothing to do with adaptive or adaptive control or learning or anything. It comes from system identification. Basically, it is like saying that eventually you are going to solve some linear system of equations and the senior system of equations must have a solution. If it does not, then you cannot, okay. So, that is what it comes to. You write, you can write this E1, E2 system, uh, so this, this dynamics. Ah, okay, I guess it is done. Ah, you can write this E1 uh, psi 2 theta tilde dynamics in this, you know, linear system structure that you can see, okay. And, and this structure uh, leads to some persistence excitation type results, okay. So, basically you have, uh, you, this is what it will look like, I guess, E1 psi 2 and theta tilde, this bottom right, 
minus k1 1 0 0 minus k2 f and you will have 0 minus gamma f0 right we will have something like this I think this is correct right minus gamma f right yeah 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 this is absolutely right this is the bottom right is what you will have okay whatever is in the bottom right is what you will have so this is the structure that you will have and this structure is amenable to applying some nice results on persistence of excitation which are pretty classical yeah and you can actually claim that you will achieve uh, parameter convergence also under persistence of excitation yeah because we don't talk about it so i'm not going to go into it in much detail but like i said doing further steps in barbalat's lemma is useless in this particular case because you cannot prove parameter convergence all you can prove is that product of theta tilde and f goes to zero okay now f uh, is passing through zero regularly the function f itself is going through zeros then this means nothing right? theta tilde is not going to zero okay but if the function f is such that it never goes to zero it is always non zero then yes it means theta tilde so you are asking something from f okay so if you notice there is a nice structure here so you see the zero f and zero minus gamma f they are transpose of each other just with a gamma multiplied right so you are asking something on f the last column and the last row okay that last column and last row has to have persistence of excitation okay and and if it so happens that f never hits zero then you automatically have persistence of excitation uh, that is a nice assumption this is a very bad assumption notice that's why i said very carefully when i made boundedness assumption on f i did not just make a random arbitrary boundedness on f that would mean i'm only allowing functions like sin x and all that i am not saying that i am saying that f is bounded if the states are bounded so polynomial x is allowed x x squared allowed yeah because if yeah that's why i was very careful assume f x is t is bounded if states are bounded if x is bounded that is allowing polynomials but if you just say f is bounded then i am only allowing sinusoid and all the trigonometric functions right pretty sad you see i you know in the space of all analytic functions i went to the sines and cosines right so obviously i am significantly weakening uh, or, or strengthening my requirements and weakening the set of functions that i can work with huh? so that's the idea yeah this assumption that the function doesn't pass through zero even sin x doesn't satisfy so i mean you can see that it's not that easy yeah on the other hand sin x is persistently exciting so i can tell you the parameters will converge if f of x t is sin of x parameters will converge okay because it's persistently exciting yeah or whatever delta persistent in this case all right uh, so that's basically adaptive control for you in a nutshell there are of course many many more cases and so on and so forth as you can see i've already taught a entire semester and probably do that next semester also but yeah yeah so uh, but that's essentially the nutshell of what is yeah adaptive control yeah we will do some more again new modern controls in the subsequent lectures yeah all right any questions no okay we'll stop here thank you